The following interview was conducted with William Field, Professor of Agricultural and Biological Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, February 2, 2010 in Stewart 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Field. My yeah. pleasure. Thank okay. you. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you were, where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born about 200 yards from the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, which is in upstate in Otsego County. Uh, it's uh, at the time was primarily a very rural county uh, with uh, seven, eight hundred dairy farms, and so I grew up in a community that was really focused around baseball and dairy farms. Um, I. Um, father was a truck driver and uh, did a lot of deliveries uh, in from mostly uh, food products from outside of the region into that area because uh, it was kind of isolated. And my ma mother was a, a, a postmaster, postmistress, and it was interesting that uh, I grew up in a, in a home where the post office was in basically our living room uh, from about 1918 through, uh, oh, in the mid-90s, when my mother finally retired. My grandmother was the postmaster for 40-some years, and my mom was the postmaster for 40-some years. And so we had a regular flow of people into our house on a daily basis who well, were retrieving their mail. Did they have a box, or they just went and she would give it to them? Yeah, there was about uh, 50 or 60 patrons that had mailboxes, and if they... Um, uh, would come in and, and at that time we would in the spring we would receive literally thousands and thousands of baby chicks that would be delivered and then honeybees and all kinds of other things and then because we produced a lot of maple syrup uh, during the um, right before Christmas would be literally hundreds if not thousands of gallons of maple syrup and small packages would be shipped out to um, residents around the country that they were shipped from your right from the post office there so um, uh, so anyway I grew up being uh, very familiar with how the post office operates in a small rural community and and even until my mom retired uh, we would just all of us children would just write my mom by putting mom 13349 and that was the zip code of that post office and everyone knew that was to my mother so we didn't have to use her name or anything. We just used the zip code. She had a name and number, alphanumeric. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Where did you go? Did you tell us about grade school and high school? Well, I attended uh, uh, my first year of school. Kindergarten was in the basement of the um, uh, town library because we didn't have much of a place at that time. Uh, and that was directly across the street from the Baseball Hall of Fame. And... Uh, then moved into a new elementary school uh, for my first through sixth grade, and it was a brand new school, but fairly small, not, not, a, not a very large one. There was one or two classes per grade, and that went up through, um, at the time, seventh grade, and then attended Cooperstown Central High School, which served a fairly large area uh, because it, there, the population was quite limited there. Uh, there were about oh, 90 ch kids in my graduating class. Of high school? High school, uh -huh. uh, which uh, um, a fair share of them stayed in the community and, and uh, worked in the dairy industry, you know, on the dairy farms. And um, at the school was, uh, uh, was quite old. It was the same school that my, both my mom and my dad attended. Uh, it was a three-story brick building that was located in the center of town, which has now been torn down. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I have fond memories of a fairly small school with, with a small number of teachers, and we got to know everybody pretty well. Sure. Were you in any student clubs at all, or organizations? Oh, not really. Uh, I don't think I would say myself as being a, a, a busybody in, in student activities. Uh, I was involved in, early on, in. Um, I wanted to play football, but at, uh, <coughs> at, at about eighth grade, I still weighed 90 pounds, and everyone else weighed 150 or 200 pounds. And so finally, the football coach encouraged me to take up cross country. And so I ended up running cross country track for three years, uh, which has uh, really opened a lot of doors for me. I had a wonderful coach, 
who encouraged me a great deal, and um, I did quite well. I, was, I had an opportunity to, to use some of that to get into college later on and, and ran a little bit in college. Um, I was a miler in, in high school and college, and back then when we ran miles, now we now it's all metric, but uh, I still think of it as a you know, mile uh, run. And, and other than that, I worked a great deal. I had um, did a fair amount of work on dairy farms and milk cows, uh, up putting crops, and then had a real interest in a, a local farm that produced a fair amount of vegetables and produced uh, a, probably the largest gladiola producer in that part of the state. So we raised uh, and planted by hand 50 or 60,000 gladiola bulbs every year, and they were all planted by hand and then all cut by hand and then shipped into various markets uh, for, for sale. And I really enjoyed the flower part of that. And, and, and then we also raised tomatoes and sweet corn and melons and all of that. So I uh, spent a, f a good part of my growing up life, part of that, that time of my life was working. Right. And I enjoyed doing that. Yeah, that's a good start. All right. And then you went, to, how did you have to select, and then you went on to uh, this state? <coughs> State University Ag and Technical first. Right. I, 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 I'd never really applied for college, but I had a aunt who uh, was, again, quite encouraging, along with this cross-country coach, who made a contact at uh, this two-year technical college on Long Island, out in the middle of Long Island, uh, which uh, had, a, at the time, a very good cross-country team. And, and, and so the connection was made, and my aunt uh, encouraged me to apply for what was called at the time the Clark Foundation uh, scholarships. And the Clark family uh, is heir of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And their summer home was in Cooperstown. It's an interesting town in that the, the Anheuser-Busch family had a summer home there. Uh, the Morris family in the area, which, which were involved with Anaconda Copper, um, the Spalding family from the sports. tennis sports, tennis rackets and all that kind of stuff had a summer home and the Clark family and so they had, I, I remember there were the polo grounds that were near the Clark estates but they put a fair amount of money and, and, a, and very, had a very um, a unique vision and that uh, at the time they practically guaranteed any graduate that would finish high school uh, support to attend uh, post-secondary. And so at one time... From that community? That, yes. Okay. So the last I heard that they, you know, that they were supporting about six, seven hundred students a year off of this trust, which, um, and so they paid for my tuition and room and board uh, for all four years of college. Um, and at that time, tuition wasn't very much. If you know much about the New York State system, uh, tuition was $200 a semester, uh, which is hard for our students to grasp today. But uh, it was uh, you know, it was doable. And so my family didn't have much money. And so the Clark family put me through, through college. And uh, I ended up going to Farmingdale without any uh, counseling as to what I was going to do when I got there, other than to run cross country. And so I went down there a week early and for pre-season training. At the end of it, the coach says, well, we'll keep you, but now we need to s figure out some coursework you ought to take. So I had absolutely no... Um, sports first, yeah, courses sports next, first, right? Yeah, sports first, courses second. So, <laughs> we know where our priorities yeah. <laughs> are. <laughs> so I, uh, he asked me, it was the coach who asked me what I liked doing, and I had spent uh, all these years on, f on a farm and did a lot of repair work on machinery. So they looked around and they found a, a, a course or a, a major called mechanical power technology that dealt with machinery. And, and that's I, an impressive name. Yeah. So I John Deere can use you too. Right. And my and my faculty there were uh, re, uh, the department has a retired John Deere engineer uh, from Grumman's aircraft sure. industry for Pratt and Whitney. Most of them are retired from industry, and so. They were not at all like our current Purdue faculty, were kind of wimpy. Uh, these guys came out of industry and had very high expectations. And so 90 of us started this two-year program, and only 30 of us practically graduated. 
and, and I know some finished up later on, but there was only 30 of the original 90 that graduated after a two-year program. And and so it was... Um, Did you live right there, too? Yeah. Oh. At the time, uh, when I went down there, they, it was a primarily uh, non-residential campus. Uh, they then built some dorms, uh, but... Uh, uh, they only put up a very small number of students on campus. So I stayed with an Italian lady, Mrs. Gerardo, and we taught with her for years. But uh, she would make sure I got in by 10 every night, even though that was none of the business. But I, she just felt like a mom to me, and she made me mow her lawn, and, and I stayed up in her attic in a little apartment that she used to rent out and make some money on the side. Sure. And that was... Um, and uh, what of, of interest to me is, I guess... When I went there, Farmingdale was an agricultural campus. It had a dairy farm, it had a large orchard, large uh, vegetable production facility, research facility. They produced a lot of their own products there. They had hogs, they had beef, chickens, they produced eggs for the dorms. And um, it was surrounded by agricultural land. Right across the road was watermelon, potatoes when I went there. And all that's gone now. It's all been totally built up. And now it's converted into a four-year college. Is that uh, Long Island University? On Long Island. No, no, oh. it's still Farmingdale. Oh, but and part of the SUNY system. It's part of the SUNY system. It's one of the 11 agricultural and technical colleges at the time. Now that's, I think that's dropped to probably eight or so. But at that time, there were 11 of these two-year programs that were part of the SUNY system. And... and um, and it was a good experience. Uh, I've only been back once, uh, but uh, while I was there, I was very active in student government. I was treasurer of the student government at the time, and uh, uh, just learned a, a lot about handling money and, and how, how a little bit about the politics of life, uh, you know, what, what, what really, you know, who are the rainmakers and who, who makes things happen. What about the sports, though? Did you continue? Yeah, I ran for two years there. Okay. We had a very good team. Uh, we ran in the National Junior College Cross Country Meet, and, uh, and so it, that was a good experience. And then when I finished up there, I um, uh, then transferred it within the SUNY system. I looked at Cornell, but I never felt like I was probably capable of going to Cornell because I, I, I I think at that time I, I, I had limited self-worth about myself academically because my interests were, were very applied. I, I liked working, I liked solving problems, and in that course of farming, a lot of hands-on. Yeah, a lot of hands-on. And, and yet it really broadened me as far as um, how industry looks at solving problems because I worked with faculty that came out of industry. Uh, they were they were just not esoteric or you know they not, not only taught they learned it through a book process but rather through their own applications. Um, <coughs> so I ended up going to Buffalo uh, and being encouraged to go there by the cross country coach because it's still the, another opportunity to run. But that was kind of a tumultuous time uh, that would have been in 1969. Okay. And when I got there, uh, things were tense all two years that I was there, mainly because of the very strong opposition to the war at that time in, in the Buffalo region. And, and the State University of New York at Buffalo was a real hotbed of, of opposition. And, and um, uh, it, it, it might interest people that while I was at Farmingdale, uh, I was invited to participate in a student retreat at a uh, kind of a retreat center in the Catskills. And, and so it was all pay expenses paid and, and because I never had much money, although I saw it as a way to pay for my weekend meals. But so I went to this thing and it was a two day, came in on Friday and left Sunday night. And uh, it turned out to be a organizational meeting for the Students for Democratic Society. The SDS. The SDS. And some of its leadership was there, and, and, and I come up in a fairly conservative background, and that was just kind of interesting to me, is, is the guess. thinking process that was going on there. And the F attempts to organize students, and there were two things they were struggling with at the time. One was the war, but the other was 
the attempts by Rockefeller to raise the tuition to the SUNY system. Uh, oh, he was the governor at that time? Right. Okay. And so there was an attempt made to... That would be Nelson. Right, Nelson Rockefeller. To, to increase. So there were literally thousands and thousands of students that marched on Albany to oppose raising it to from $400 a year, I think it was to something like $600 a year. It was just unacceptable to the students. Um, and so it, uh, it was dirt cheap, quite frankly, as I look back at it, you know, because I don't know how they ran all this for that. I mean, that's, they're still paying for it, but uh, as a state, they, they never will be out of debt. It's a, mo it's a monolithic uh, Sunni system. It's just huge. Huge. Right. It's huge. Yeah. And, and so while at Buffalo, uh, it didn't take very long before I realized that uh, uh, there was a vacuum um, that existed within the uh, student government with respect to the handling of money. And there was a, uh, some corruption that had occurred before I occurred before I got there, and so people were left and fired or whatever. They, you know, they just were removed from those offices. So within a month or two, I became treasurer of the student union board, which is the group that invited in all of the um, outside speakers, the concerts. Uh, we we uh, had a fairly large budget of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year at that time. And we had people like Dion Warwick and um, um, all the, 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 the imitator, the, Nel uh, the uh, Nixon, I can't remember his name, um, Little. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. My name is well, we had, well, we'd sit down and plan out the whole year. Uh, we had no paid staff. It was all students who were, had this. Of this pot of money that we would then allocate out to get the biggest bank. You could bank. call and invite right. whoever you wanted. And we worked through agents to do that. And then the following year, I was then elected to the treasurer position for the student body. And then I was the first, at that time, it was uh, uh, the voting age was dropped to 18. And I was the first um, student elected to the uh, Board of Trustees. At, at, at Buffalo, and um, it was kind of an odd time because I was the only student in the room, and I was truly considered as an outsider. I mean, because th th I don't think anyone in the room wanted a student who had voting privileges sitting on the board. How did that come about? The, the, the trustee or the, the regents would be the school that decided that the board should have a student on there. Right, every every every. Um, <coughs> institution within the SUNY system had a board of trustees. Right. And then you had the, the chancellor that oversaw the whole SUNY system who also had a trust group of trustees. Uh, but the, most of the power at the local level was through this board. They were the ones that, that put forward the name to the provost or the chancellor for the president. Uh, E.K. Fretwell was the president at the time who later became president, I think, of North Carolina State. Um, and, and so the students nominated me, and there was nobody ran because nobody cared, I don't think, or it wasn't there. And so the first issue that came up before the Board of Trustees was a, there was a strong student uh, press to bring alcohol on campus. Well, I grew up as a Baptist, and I didn't drink. So the vote was like 11 to 1. I was the only vote against it, which, uh, which the students thought was out outrageous, that the only student member of the trustees voted against bringing the alcohol on campus. And I still don't think alcohol belongs on campus when we have 80% of the campus that we serve is underage. And I still find that strange here at Purdue that we are so intoxicated by having alcohol on campus that we press that issue so hard. But, um, anyway, that's another issue. But um, it was a, a growing experience, and then everything broke loose there in 60. 70 or so, and uh, that was when the riots occurred on campus. They attempted to burn the library, set it on fire. Is it yeah. oh. uh, most of the faculty left campus. Uh, E.K. Fretwell called all the resident dormitory assistants and student body leaders together and said, would we take care of the campus? And then he left. And it was basically left. And, and there was, uh, we, we formed a, 
actually I was part of a fire brigade that was in the Union that put out you know, quite a number of fires in the Union that were set. Um, it, was, it was kind of an interesting time. Uh, and then when the um, Kent State incident occurred, that was right, the spring of 70, I think it was. Yeah. Um, just everything just deteriorated. They closed school early. Uh, nobody finished exams. Nobody. Uh, we were hired because we were part of the student government, and, and, but we were hired to clean the dorms. And we took truckloads of stuff that was abandoned. People just left, and we didn't. You know, we were told to clean it out. We took a lot of it down to homeless shelters and stuff like that. And, but uh, they, I can't remember how many, it was a couple of weeks that we closed early. You can imagine, like here at Purdue, if suddenly something happened and everyone was sent home before exams were over. It was, a, it was, it was pretty chaotic. Um, every night during that week of Kent State, um, the police surrounded the campus but never intervened much. Uh, it was, it was it, a presence. Yeah, the, everyone was told to leave campus except for those that group of students that were basically trying to maintain some order, which was kind of different. Um, but um, we had a lot of international students that didn't know where to go. Everyone else that could left. Um, the campus was located right next to the Buffalo Mental uh, was Health Facility. Uh, some of the student organizers that were opposed, you know, that were doing the demonstrations, broke into the facility and allowed inmates or patients, and they began to wander the campus and, in their pajamas. And it was, it was just a very awkward, different time. Hundreds of beds were taken out of the dormitories and thrown across uh, where the overpass uh, enters near the campus. The through a through yeah, there was a throughway. It was a. It's actually the main route to go from the throughway to Niagara Falls, up around. <coughs> and all those beds were piled up on the interstate or on the four lane highway, as to block it. And anything they could do to make a statement. They just kept going with this right. rampage. They w they went downtown and and burned the Marine Midland Bank and and uh, they marched. You know, it's just. There seemed to be no order to it. It was just chaos, and um, for a, a guy who grew up in a very conservative, quiet community, it was like it was really quite different. But it's it was a it was kind of a growing time, and then the following year was um, uh, it, the the confrontation switched to basically a race based confrontation. Um, we had uh, the student. Government invited Muhammad Ali, uh, who was at that time Cassius Clay, and, and maybe a lot of people don't remember him, but uh, uh, he came to campus and he met with us, and then we he introduced us to uh, members of the black community, and uh, there were some long drawn out discussions that took place that were sometimes very uncomfortable. Uh, I'd grown up in a school that was all white in a county that was basically all white. I, I, I never quite understood those issues, you know, like maybe someone out of the South, because I never had any relationships with uh, <coughs> anyone who was of color um, much before that. And but uh, we had uh, several pastors that came in. Tom Skinner, remember that name, um, who uh, worked to try to build some bridges in the community, and there were some interesting black pastors. Uh, and, but I was, I remember the meetings we had in, uh, with, with uh, Muhammad Ali, or Cassius Clay, uh, who was just trying to open the dialogue that, you know, that was a different time. So uh, I finally uh, uh, had made enough enemies at uh, Buffalo because of just trying to be one side or the other that uh, during the last month of school, I always remember this, is the... Uh, uh, the a group of faculty asked to audit some of our um, records, and they denied my graduation, even though I had enough credits to graduate. And they um, determined that either because we had not completed the prior year schooling, or didn't have, you know, the, whatever it was, that I, I ended up having to take six additional credit hours 
at another institution, and uh, it's always sort of left a you know a negative taste. But it was it was a very charged time where there were faculty who who were basically quite prejudiced prejudiced about the black community, or were quite prejudiced about the, the, the whole issue of those who were involved in the anti-war movement. And so as a student, if you were doing anything that was visible, you, you became sort of a lightning rod. So several of us got kicked around a bit at that time. But you know, we finished, I, I went, and I never, uh, I had a teaching certificate at that point when I was done. I could, I could teach high school um, uh, industrial arts. Uh, don't ask me how all that transpired, but that's ended up where it was. And, but I had no interest in teaching. I went back and no cops. And then became uh, quite embedded into a family dairy operation and uh, worked full time doing that. And then the, uh, the farmer that um, I worked for was uh, uh, friends with a local superintendent of schools, and, and I was invited to teach part time at a local school. And then I started my teaching experience. And I taught four years vocational agriculture, went to Cornell three summers got certified to teach in ag, and then I got a scholarship that, that or assistantship that let me stay at Cornell, but I didn't want to stay there. I thought they were kind of, a, kind of an arrogant environment. So there was a lot of students from New York City and fairly wealthy families that attended Cornell, and, and I just felt there was an arrogance there that was unrelated to how I grew up, and so I ended up moving to Minnesota. Yeah, I see where you got your graduate there. Right. <coughs> um, and then that, that worked out, you liked it. Did you have any uh, leads on how you have to pick the university there? Or? Well, I had, uh, I guess, three options. I was under what was called the Student Defense Loan, SDL loan. Oh, okay. Uh, which per and then you submitted your application, and I got back acceptance at Cornell because I was attending there and was doing pretty well. And then Minnesota and one other place, and I can't remember. Uh -huh. <coughs> so I went out there thinking I would get uh, a master's in agricultural education with a strong emphasis in ag engineering. I wasn't really happy with the ag engineering program there. At that time, it was pretty small and not very progressive. So I switched mostly to education and minored in, uh, got a minor in Chinese studies. Which was kind of odd. I mean, but I, I loved. Well, I, I should say that growing up, my mom was had a gift of being a hostess, and she, she would put up anyone who came through that needed a place to stay. And they would, oftentimes, we would be kicked out of our beds so that oftentimes visiting missionaries would be able to find a place to stay. And so we had several missionaries that were kicked out of China in 1949. And I was fairly, I was born in 49, so these people came back and they were sort of a wandering group for a while. They didn't know quite what to do. And so some of the churches put these people up, and my mom put them up, and so I got to learn about China. And I was always fascinated by these stories of these Chinese missionaries. And what they were doing. Right. There, and, <coughs> and how they were forced to leave and sure. all that kind of stuff. So, so I just started taking courses on China, Minnesota. Minnesota had a very strong China program. But I didn't know what I'd ever do with it. And then uh, I was there two years. Uh, but uh, moved up there in 75. And that summer, I uh, went to Hong Kong and tried to go to China. I, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I'm not very sophisticated in travel. I'd never been outside of the country before. But you went to Hong Kong. So I flew to Hong Kong and <laughs> um, got on a train and was detained at the border in 1975. And they sort of laughed at me, saying, you, you know, you can't come in here. I said, well, I'd like to, would you let me, you know? And they put me back on another train going the other way. So, <laughs> so I tried a couple more times, but it never <laughs> never worked out. And I, then I came home and I then I went to Minnesota. So um, at least I could say that I tried early on in that process, that was pretty early. There weren't many people going to China in 1975. No, let alone by train. <laughs> well, there's a train that goes from Hong Kong up through the new territories <laughs> to Kowloon. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. 
Darwin and up into Guangzhou. And so, and that had to wait for a while. Then I, I um, uh, finished my degrees there and was offered a position here at Purdue. How did that come up? Were they advertised? Did somebody come up? No, or? my advisor at Minnesota knew somebody here on the faculty and and so the next thing I know I got a call from Jerry Isaacs who was the department head and said we'd like you to come down and interview him. And um, he's still alive. He was department head at the University of Florida Gainesville for a while. And, uh, oh, he left Purdue and went down? Yes, he did. Okay. And then okay. his, he has two kids that are you know, adult children that live here and they're very active in the symphony and I think one of them teaches violin or something like that. But, so he's in the area quite often. But um, he just called me down there. And, and I went through an interview with him and Bruce McKenzie, who was, you should interview Bruce McKenzie. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. With, uh, just 45 years here at Purdue. But uh, I love him to pieces. I mean, he's just a wonderful mentor for me. So they interviewed me, and, and, uh, and then they offered me a job. What year, so what year did you come 1977. to? 1977. Okay. Were you married at that time? Uh, yes. Okay. What was, where did you live when you first uh, came here? Uh, we, the first place we lived in was marriage or in um, PRF housing on Happy Hall, oh, Hollow Road. Oh, right on the Castle Ward. They were all, it's all bulldozed now. Sure. And A lot of people I, I talked to lived there when they first came. We had no money when we moved here. We moved here in a U-Haul. It was a handy location, yeah. too. U-Haul trailer and car on behind and... And uh, we, we had no money in the bank, and I mean that's a lot of young faculty come come here, which we sometimes are not too sensitive about because they spend it all trying to get through school. <laughs> so uh, uh, I replaced Dick Wilsey in 1977, and Dick Wilsey was the extension safety specialist since the mid 40s, 1944, 1945, somewhere in that time period. And so there's only been two of us in that position. And, it, and so between the two of us, we've held that position for 62 plus years mm -hmm. or more. And so he was my mentor for a while. He retired. He owned an apple orchard uh, uh, west of town here. Wilsey's had Christmas trees and apples. And he was married to Helen, who just passed away a year or so ago. But um, uh, he... I just moved into his office, and I still have some of his files. I mean, I just you still got the same office? Yes. Uh, so we've uh, uh, sort of carried on that work for for a long time. It's kind of rare to have a position like that with only two people in it for over sixty years. Right. So well, then the, when you started the breaking new ground. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. All right. But early on, uh, one when of had he been, he'd been doing something in a similar area, but not exactly, huh? Yeah, his area was is primarily injury prevention, safety and health, okay. uh, anything to enhance the quality of life of farm and rural families in the state of Indiana. That's to try what to I prevent was, accidents right, and things. Okay. Right. Proof health and early on, his work was he did everything with even going back early, was encouraging you know better outhouses and better sure. water. Better sources, quality of life. Yeah, all those kind of things. Anything that would make people sick or right. injured. And so I picked up on that and had those responsibilities, but it was changed, more focused on machinery and things that I had made them more interested in. And then in 1979, we, which I'd only been here a short time, a farmer from up in northern Indiana um, in Royal Center uh, called me up and we talked on the phone. And he had experienced a high-level spinal cord injury uh, due to a truck accident. And on the farm? On the, yeah, on the farm. And so he asked me to come up, and I, I drove up there. And the reason I got the call was I was the newest faculty on, on, the, on the newest faculty member that, had, uh, that was available. And no, you know, I just think those are the kind of calls you shove off to the new person. But I drove up there, and here was a guy, a big strapping guy, sitting in a wheelchair that wanted to drive a tractor. And, and uh, for me, it wasn't very strange because one of the farmers I'd worked for had had polio. And when I was a little kid, I would ride with him on the tractor because it was hard for him to get on and off. And he would direct me to do certain things, like if something got out of alignment. And I was fairly little doing it. Um, Today would say it would have been very unsafe, but I was basically a form of assistive technology helping that guy. So, 
So uh, Bill and his name was Bill. We um, talked for a while, and, and then we got a group of students together, and we ended up in, in involving the Braun Corporation, which was fairly small at that time, up in Winnemac, and we got a school bus lift. That's on the short buses you see running around town. It's a lift to put someone with a wheelchair on, lift them up, put them in there. And we mounted that on the side of the, this guy's tractor. And it enabled Bill to get up onto the tractor and then transfer over into the seat of the tractor. And then with some hand controls, which were just basically metal pieces that extended the levers on the floor, he was able to drive it. And I always remember when we got him in that tractor, we went out in a field and it was a big tractor and, and just how much that made him feel um, all to more, more fulfilled or, or complete because he was able to drive that tractor. What he'd been doing. Right, or sitting in a chair. And that was kind of... Function. What age was he? In his 40s or 50s? Oh no, he was a fairly young guy in his uh, mid-20s at the time. How did the, how had the accident occur? Well, he was driving his pickup home, you know, from town, and it got off the road, rolled over, and, and it broke his back. Um, and so Bill opened my eyes, I think, to a lot of issues of uh, discrimination, because he couldn't get in any place, he couldn't go to a restaurant, he couldn't go to McDonald's, he couldn't go anywhere, because he was in a wheelchair. And, and at that time, if you think about it, 1979, you know, it was the ADA was not passed until '92. You know, I, I, I actually have a I do a class once in a while for the diversity group on campus, and I say, you know, when was Brown versus uh, the Board of Education that allowed full access to public schools it was 1954, and so the black communities had full access to Purdue University, technically, legally, since 1954. I mean, you you could say you don't want them there, you could put barriers in the way. But, but the Supreme Court has allowed them to have full access. Uh, we didn't have full access for people with disabilities until 1990, 92, when Bush signed the ADA. The ADA. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, I share that, and, and some people are kind of taken back by that, but just, you know, they say, well, yeah, I always thought that it was the Good other point. way around. You know? so, um, and so I got to travel with Bill. Um, we got on a plane together out of O'Hare Airport, flew up to Canada to a meeting of disabled farmers that was held up there. We learned how difficult it was to go through the airport, to park a car, to get on a plane. And so it sort of stimulated me to, to, to um, maybe get a little more involved in, in accessibility issues. Uh, we came back, you know, we, 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 after working on Bill's tractor, we did an article for the Prairie Farmer magazine. It's a one column, I still have it has a picture of Bill's tractor and maybe 200 words. And we started getting calls um, from them. people who had similar kinds of issues they wanted to fix. So that really started the Breaking the Ground project. And then in, then in um, uh, 1980, something in that neighborhood, I was at a meeting with um, a fellow from John Deere, and he gave us our first grant to begin working on it modifying farm tractors for people with disabilities. And it was, it got us kicked off and we've been running ever since. Uh, we've raised millions and millions of dollars to improve access to rural communities, to machinery, so that they can run it. But uh, some of our biggest battles were here at Purdue. And you know, there's every side of you know, an institution like this, there's sort of, sort of those shadows that sometimes it takes a little good light to shine, shine into those corners. But, you know, I had a dean tell me he would never spend a dime at this institution making anything accessible for people with disabilities. He clearly had this negative feeling about people who had looked different or less capable. And, and we struggled with that a long time. And, uh, and sometime in the early 80s, I had I'd acquired by that time a group of friends who were farmers who happened to be in wheelchairs. It was 1982, we had a, a workshop in Indianapolis, uh, and we invited farmers from throughout the Midwest. We had 50, 60 farmers come. From the Midwest region, yeah, states. Yeah, and it, there was a big farm show at that time. It was in February or something. And, and uh, we, we spent two or three days together. 
and we got some funding to do that and developed some real close relationships with wonderful people who had all kinds of issues. Um, I just got a call from one the other night, it was in the, in the last week or so, um, he was at that event. He was at the time eight or nine year old farm boy who had lost both arms in a farm accident. And he had teamed up. At that up. time he was at that age? Yeah. That point. yeah. He was little when it happened, but uh, he had come to the workshop and he had teamed up with this guy Chip, who we know, who had lost both legs in a farm accident. And the two of them were hilarious together. I mean, he had a little boy who was very funny, but he called me up the other night and was telling me, we were just thinking about this, and here it's been since 1982, and it's still that relationship. Still, I, there's some of those guys I still see. Sure. But um, I invited them all to Purdue for the Farm Science Days, which were the fish fries held over in the Union, over in the when well, we used Harbor. to be here on campus. Right. Uh -huh. And there was a, we were going to have lunch in the Union, and I was assured we could get into the Union through the elevator, the freight elevator. Well, we couldn't. And so these guys, who are all farmers and kind of hardy, uh, they just jumped out of their wheelchairs, got on their bottoms, and dragged their wheelchairs up into the unit. And, okay, and so it, it, it was not done as an act of activism. It was just done because it was we practical. We had to do it. it we want to get there. Yeah. And we had been told that we could get in. Well, you couldn't. And, and so um, I remember that next day or so, one of the directors of the union, one of the administrators, called me up and was very angry about embarrassing the university by bringing a bunch of crippled people. That was what, you know, the terms that were used to campus. And so, you know, and, uh, there were times where, when, you know, a story, I don't know how you want to why you want to go with this, but uh, uh, I hired a young man who ended, uh, who uh, worked for me, who was in a wheelchair, and he drove his own car, and he was modified so he could drive it. He had a wheelchair and a carrier, so he could actually get somewhere, get out, get in a wheelchair, and do stuff. And I asked about him using a university car, so, in which we'd, we'd need a set of hand controls, which. I agreed to pay, it was like 180, it was very cheap, 180 bucks, 200 bucks. And, and I was told by the administration that we didn't want crippled people driving to do cars because they were at risk. They'd be, we'd be at risk of liability and everything. And so I said, well, you can't do that. And, oh, yeah, we can. We don't have to let anybody go in cars. So Dr. Beering was president at the time, so he just bought a new jet. I don't know if you know when Dr. Beering bought a new jet, but I wrote a letter to him saying the price of a set of hand controls is substantially less than a tire on your new jet. And that did not go over well. I was a young fac, fairly young faculty, and it was taken as being kind of a, but it was kind of a true statement. I was trying to make a point that I'm trying to get a guy yeah, so, he could drive. so he could drive, and he could drive. He already had a driver's license, had, you know, he had his own car, but but when we sent them on the road to, to do things, at that time what we had was funding from the Department of Education to try to assess how big this problem is. So we traveled all over the United States visiting farmers with disabilities to see what kinds of barriers there were, what they were doing innovatively. To Look at the whole landscape and what's yeah, going on. Yeah, what was going on? And we got probably about six years of funding that then led us to begin building adaptive aids or devices that some of them had become commercialized. Be helpful. But at that time, you know, I wanted this fellow, John, to be able to drive a Purdue vehicle because he was going quite long distance in Ohio, sure. Michigan, or whatever. And, and the battle that was fought over that, and then I wrote that letter, which didn't help things at all. Um, but we ended up getting hand controls. We ended up getting a, a, an accessible van. You know, it took time. Sure. But, you know, along the way, you typically skin your noses a few times to make anything change to the better because yeah. you have that resistance that comes from right. not wanting to change. On your disabilities, did you, uh, do you work uh, any with the children at all or not, or is it more adults? Because I know some things that you've written that you, children have to be very careful too. Right. So, yeah. Well, w we work with anyone who is interested in 
pursuing careers in agriculture. So we started a project, the uh, first project was with 4-H. Uh, it, was, it might be hard to imagine that we had trouble with 4-H kids participating in some of the 4-H club activities. Somewhere I have a letter from a mom who complained that there was a child in her 4-H club with cerebral palsy. And she was concerned that the other kids were going to catch it. Well, cer cerebral palsy isn't a disease. It's, it occurs at birth due to oxygen, being deprived of oxygen. And, and that was the ignorance level that we were dealing with. But, but it wasn't just ignorance. It was, there was deep emotion and feelings and opposition that were coming out. And so we had some 4-H kids who were told they couldn't show their animals at the fairs. And so, you know, I, I agreed to work with them legally to make those accessible, which created some tension with, within the system because the counties are very closely connected to Purdue. And, and so, you know, we got, you know, we would take on issues like that and advocate for helping resolve these so a kid could be there. So we, they can participate in same, at a similar level. Right. Um, you know, we wouldn't have thought of doing that with a black kid who wanted to show a, a, a sheep or a goat or something. Sure. But for a kid that had you know, cerebral palsy, that you know, walked awkwardly or people were fearful of the way he moved or whatever, um, we found a fair amount of discrimination. And then we moved into FFA. I don't know if you're familiar with the Future Farmers and and we started a program that went nationwide to try to improve access to FFA chapters. In fact, we just finished a project with the NEC Foundation, two, uh, two and a half years of funding, and we distributed disability awareness information to every FFA chapter in the United States, 7,500 chapters. It's all developed here at Purdue. It includes uh, video, it includes lesson plans, it includes resources, and it was packaged, and then we followed up with, with um, exhibits at the National FFA Convention where we'd answer questions. It's been very successful in my And what it's doing is just saying, gee, a kid with a disability can participate in agriculture, can do things that you may not even imagine because you've got sort of blinders on. Right. So yeah. a lot of, and then I think the CHAPS program, which really was run out of our shop for nine years. Is that started up again? Uh, it's actually got two other people that were CHAPS staff who have now started their own program. Okay. But that started as a parent-driven organization. They didn't have a home for it. And the director of extension asked if I would provide it at home, and so I managed that for nine years. And we, were, we had up to 11 horses, 60-some children every week coming out for therapeutic riding lessons. We had up to three staff. And, and what really hurt us was 9-11. Uh, 2001, um, a third of our income was derived from gifts and contributions that came in throughout the year. And we went months with practically nothing because everybody's money was going to New York City. And, and so it, it really it really was a painful time. And, and so it ended up we moved it over to 4-H and they ran for a couple of years. And then then a couple of those the people involved felt they could break off and run it on their own. So those are still running, but under different names. Um, mm -hmm. Those were, what ages did you, you ha I, I bet articles, so I'm familiar with them. They were young, mostly children. Though. Oh yeah, I would say we had some that were as young as two or three, all the way up to, <coughs> we had young adults that were 18, 19. It might be interesting to see if they were <coughs> young children, and they probably appreciate it. Well, there were some interesting stories. Like we had an autistic child who had not spoken to um, his parents. And we took a horse over to their house and it was in the city limits. So it was a violation of a zoning ordinance. But we just put this horse there in the backyard with a little fence around it. And this kid started talking to the horse. And, and it was the first time that the parents had ever heard the kid community. How old was the child? It was pretty young. I would say six, eight years old. And then the child would be brought up to Camp Tecumseh where we ran our program. And the kid would start talking to the horse. And, and you can imagine for parents who had never heard their kid talk. And see, there's some wonderful research that shows that autistic children 
can bond to animals and feel very, very close to them and begin to actually attempt to communicate to them. When the horses respond, if they're well-trained horses, by nudging and licking or, you know, nuzzling up on them, and, and the kid sees that as a response, and so, uh, so the kid continues and encourages that. And, you know, whereas the parents probably, I know what I, after five or six years, I, you get tense, and the kid probably feels that tenseness when the parent's trying to get you to say something, and then you just sort of get back and become more resistant. And whereas the animals, you know, they don't show that, you know. And so it was, it was, a, it was an interesting time. I, I thought it was a, again, kind of a growing special time when, when we knew we had. Sometimes we had over 200 kids on campus volunteering out there. But I remember being called in by an administrator saying that the program was an embarrassment. I remember we struggled with being audited because we had a lot of families that couldn't afford and, and so we came up with other ways to pay for their, and the university is in its rigid nature oftentimes, couldn't understand that. You know, I'll repeat a story here, I don't know how you think about this stuff, but uh, we didn't know where our money was coming from, but this is a true story. I, I'm sitting in my office and a truck driver calls me, and he's coming down I-65 with 800 bales of hay. And he hears a little clip that we used to play on the radio about chaps, and it's a cute little thing that somebody did for us, and it would be played whenever they had time. But it just so happened they played it when he was coming up. He called up and he says, uh, are you Professor Field? They told me I need to talk to you about this chaps for a minute. I said, yeah, yeah, and, and he says, well, God told me to bring you these 800 bales of hay. And I said, yeah, that's, that's interesting, you know, he says, God told me to bring you these 800 bales of hay. I'm on I-65, and I said, well, you know, I'm not sure where I'm going to put 800 bales of hay. And I said, well, we talked about it. I said, well, I have a barn at my house. Would you mind just, you know, I could put them up in there until we figure out where we're going to put them, because we didn't have the room that came to come he said, I'll be at your house tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. You better have some people there to help unload because I, I can't do it by myself. So I called up some, some of my students and stuff. And we were there at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock. And in rolls a semi-truck with a load of bales. <laughs> <coughs> Try to explain that because that's what I put down on the uh, gift and loan report we, that God told them to bring those in. And they, they didn't understand that. <laughs> they wanted to talk to this guy. We need further <laughs> explanation for something. You can imagine that. You've been here long enough to know that. <laughs> it's interesting. I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, well, you've talked about some of the, you've been president of the uh, Hoosier Safety Council, and you went to uh, Hong Kong in 70, the trip 75, 75 and then the ter New Territories. And you've been, Canada, I thought, was sort of interesting. That A uh, couple of provinces have uh, picked mm. up on this. Well, let me back up oh, just to, okay. you know, in, in 1981, a group of Chinese visiting scholars came here to Purdue, uh -huh. and the, a note went out from the international office wanting to know if anyone would be willing to help host them. Well, nobody volunteered, so you know I was interested, and so I called up, and so I ended up hosting this van load of Chinese engineers. It was, they were from mainland China, 1981. I was surprised that there was not sort of an outpouring of interest. Well, there wasn't, and and so I spent just you. Well, I was the only faculty member, and we rented a van, and we put them all in a van, and we, I took them to farms, I took them, you know, we toured Purdue. Uh, there wasn't a very warm reception at the time. Uh, we took them out to eat, we barbecued with them. Uh, we went to a John Deere dealership, and the John Deere dealer gave them all green hats, and then wanted to take their picture with the green hats, and none of them would put them on. And we're all standing there, and I'm saying to him, well, the John Deere dealer wants a picture with all you wearing these hats. And, and, and the leader of the group came up, a very elderly, very wonderful guy, Mr. Kung, and he says, he says, Professor Field, in China, if you wear a green hat, that's signifying that your wife is unfaithful to you. So we don't want to have all of us wearing these green hats and have a picture to you. So I, that's why I had to explain that to the Deere guy. But, but anyway, the, a very short time later, they asked me if I'd come to China. And so 
in 82, I went over there. And that's still pretty early in the, in the opening of China. And I went to Luoyang and spent about two months in the summer of 82 and uh, worked with them on improving the safety of farm machinery. And uh, then it went back in 85 and did the same thing, uh, working a little bit with uh, some new John Deere materials that were that they were going to build some equipment over there. And so, and then I'm, I've, I've had a number of Chinese grad students. I've had one of the first people I met there uh, was a University of Michigan graduate whose son ended up coming to Purdue and then got his PhD. And then his son was my grad student. So I, I had three generations that I knew as a result of that trip there. So his son got a master's with me. And then, his father is, is, is a, a senior administrator at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And oh, I, nice. That worked out well for you. So then my yeah. grandfather, which is John, who I was knew when I went over there, was, um, uh, I'm sure has passed away. It's very hard to keep in touch with some of the families. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, the efforts in Canada were focused more on trying to get projects started with farmers with disabilities. So I've worked in most of the Canadian provinces with workshops uh, that were sponsored by local disability groups. Some of them were very successful. There's still programs in a couple of the province, provinces that, that uh, reach out to farmers with disabilities. We still keep in touch with them. Uh, I was up there a couple of years ago. That was the last time I was there. Mm -hmm. I probably made about 10 or more trips uh, into Canada for where we stayed for, you know, three, four, five days, trying to do something. With the province, was it the Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and those those are more the agriculture, is that more oh, the agriculture? Oh, uh, we've done so things, the west. yeah, we've done things in Montreal, in okay. or Quebec, uh, okay. uh, Ontario, uh, in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, British Columbia. Uh, I think those are the provinces. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, so let's see, you've got a, quite a few publications you've really done. One of the ones that I thought was that conference in 87 on injury in America, the injury in the agricultural workplace, even in 87, sort of yeah. setting the pace for that. Uh, that was pretty a, good. That was, uh, I think, C. Everett Coop was the Surgeon General at the time. Okay. And there was a meeting held in um, Atlanta to try to focus on you know, the impact that injury has on America. And so there was a, only a couple of us that were there representing agriculture. And we both felt it was strange, uh, the other guy was from Nebraska, University of Nebraska, was that um, it, farming had one of the highest fatality rates of all occupations. But it was generally ignored by the Centers for Disease Control. Eventually, the Centers for Disease Control started putting some money, quite a bit of money, into agricultural safety and health. It still does. Yeah, that's very good. And and you've given a lot of workshops and then a lot. How many people do you have help helping you? Just in, is Denise, she's the one that sort of set the time up. Does she work with you? Uh, Denise has been with me for 29 years. She's the only true secretary that I've ever had. And she, the only time she left was when I went to China for two months, uh, came back, and the person that she was assigned to work with wasn't very kind to her. And so she left. So immediately I went over to Arrow and brought her back. <coughs> I told her I wouldn't leave again like that unless you know I knew who she was going to work with. But, but she she has been with me for 29 years, and I, she was 18 years old, and I was absolutely intimidated by her because she was she seemed to know more than I did, and and so she sort of knows where I am and. Um, I never ask her to lie for me. I don't. I don't do that. But uh, she seems to protect me a great deal from more stuff that I can handle in a day. I mean, it's just. I'm sure she you. Has have a this. She has a sense of it. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. nice. But you've done a lot of a lot of publications and a lot of workshops and things. Yeah, we've yeah. done. And because I'm mostly extension, right. and my goal is is to try to engage the community in these problems, and the way to do that is in my mind, is not over the internet. It's actually yeah. get people face to face. That's right. And get to pe where people like each other and trust each other. So you're dealing with an issue like improving the accessibility of the fairgrounds. Uh, you can't do that 
even over the telephone. You, you got to bring people together around the table and have the person with a disability say, well, you know, I can't participate in the 4-H building because there's no way to get in there. Or I, I don't dare come to the fair because there's no accessible toilet and I, you know, I really need that if I'm going to be away from home for a length of time. And then to hear the fair board people say, well, gee, I never realized that before. You know, I'm just not familiar with these issues. And, and so you build bridges and then you see some dramatic changes. Uh, we, I think, have been instrumental in, in uh, some of the Lilly grants that have gone into, I'm talking about big chunks of money, a million dollars, where they've improved the accessibility of, of, of an entire fairgrounds. Parking, toilets, the one in Indiana fairgrounds there. Oh, even the Indiana State Fairgrounds. We've had displays there. We've intentionally have invited dozens of people with disabilities to come to the fair, fully knowing that they're going to have trouble, but realizing that this is a group of people that aren't there to sue or to make some kind of a loud statement, but they just want to be able to participate. Right. And, and they're, that's their in, they're interested. And they right. like to be there. Right. And so now we have very we have one of the most accessible fairgrounds in the country. <coughs> and I, I don't think, I think a lot of people take credit for that. But, w but we have had uh, efforts to try to do that for a long time. Right, it takes a while to get that stuff going away. Yeah. Let's talk about some of your awards. I think that uh, the leader of the year, uh, year, Indiana Progressive Farmer, that's very nice. In 2000, you yeah. got that. Mm -hmm. And the Dean's Team Award, that's a very nice award. Congratulations. Well, thank you. It's very nice. And the Humpty Award. Mm -hmm. I, I Humpty was gone when he was not president. When right. You came. Uh, you had Hanson was here. When you were there. Yeah. I think probably the award that I appreciate the probably the most of any um, was the uh, Sagamore, which was take took me total by surprise. I worked with a. A group and when we're off camera, I'll tell you about a friend who got a Sagamore by surprise. Go ahead. And and uh, we were working with a group over in the Williamsport area to try to start a support group for family members with disabilities. This is Williamsport here yeah. in Indiana? Okay. okay. And um, Sue Hetherington, I don't know if that name means about it. She's a Purdue grad. And she was at the hospital, and she provided some of the structure to make this happen. But I tried to go to the meeting. You know, and I'm busy, but I would go over there and we'd meet it. If we, we tried to meet at Arnie's in Williamsburg. Well, it wasn't accessible. And so I met with the owner of Arnie's, and he made it accessible so you could get in there. And so I remember going over there. We had some really nice evenings. It, it, there was nothing intellectually stimulating or significant that happened other than people had a good time together. And then one night, I, they, um, my wife asked to go along which is kind of odd because she don't know how to do that. And so she, she, we got in the car and she said, well, I just want to see what you guys do over there. So I drive over there. To Williamsport. Williamsport to, for this meeting, which I just think is we're going to eat pizza. And, and, and I'm just like, there are times in my life when I feel like, yeah, maybe I, I don't need another night out. But, you know, I just, I just want to make this thing work. So I go over there with my wife. And we get in there and we're just talking. And next thing you know, um, um, it was Sheila Clinker. Um, came in, and I, that, I thought that was kind of weird. But you know, and then, and then they, and then they had this plaque, you know, from the governor that, for helping get this thing started, you know, and then other things, you know, that fit into that. But see, that was, you know, so many awards that we give at Purdue have this agenda behind them. You know, we're trying to get somebody promoted, and I think they've lost some of its the punch. And, and it's all it's all framed. It's all framed. Oh yeah, yeah. And it beautiful. And and I was absolutely S shocked. Super. Yeah, I just and it was a bunch of local people. There was no big shots, but somebody in that group went and talked to. Did your wife know in advance? Though? Yeah, she they they had called her and, and asked her to come, and she had to figure out a way to because she know you know I was out last night till eleven thirty doing an extension meeting in Wabash, you know. <laughs> And so she doesn't, you know, that's how many of those do you want to go to go with? So, and then the other word that I thought was kind of interesting on that list is the Martin Luther King. Award. I was going to ask you about that. And that is, it's almost comical. It'd be, it'd make a nice little video. 
And, and I get this letter from the governor saying that he had selected me to receive the Martin Luther King Award, Spirit of Justice. So um, my wife was going to go, but then we had, uh, we'd had another baby, and so she wasn't feeling real well. Either she wasn't or the baby wasn't, so my son went home. And so we got in down the car, in Indianapolis. down in Indianapolis, in the governor's office. Who would that have been by? Or? Um, that would have been or Obama. Obama, okay. And so we went down there, and I go in the governor's office, and there are two black females sitting at the at, at kind of reception table. And I give them my letter. And I, I said, um, I'm here for the Martin Luther King Spirit of Justice. And, the, and, I'm, and that made me look at them for several seconds. It made me feel kind of awkward. We just looked at them. Oh. And one of them said, I think there might be a mistake. So they both get up and leave me, standing there with my son. And they came back and said, can we see your letter? And, and I said, sure, here's the letter signed by the governor. And they look at this letter, and they take the letter away. And they leave me standing there, and they come back, and they say, oh, Dr. Field, I think we've got this straight now. They thought I was black. And, and so the, the entire, everybody there, was, it was an award, I think, intended to give to leaders in the black community for, for improving the quality of life of people. And <laughs> it was just kind of like, were but I was nominated by someone who, who we had worked with who had nominated me directly to the governor, and, and I don't think that'll probably happen again. So I don't, you know, I know it's a kind of a silly little story, but it's no, uh, interesting. So there was a. And, there were, and uh, I think the other thing is that uh, ag alumni associations are typical of distinction. Oh, yeah, that okay. those are really those are That'd nice. Be, yeah. And you're a fellow of AASP. Now, when you came in the department was uh, for the researchers was agricultural engineering, and now it's ag agricultural and biology. Right, engineering. exactly. Um, Can I okay. tell you a funny story about that? Uh huh. Is that uh, when? I was I was asked to be interim department head. I think this ought to go in history, okay? Okay. But, but uh, there was a we hired a, several new faculty who were I was on my list. who go did ahead. not come out of agriculture backgrounds. Okay. And they wanted to change the name to biological engineering. And there was a, a discussion, you know, they were serious about it. And because they really couldn't relate to agriculture. Because they were non farm and, but they were doing great work in the biological area, so the compromise was made to call it biological and agricultural engineering. And, Jim, and Bob Ringel was, was the provost at the time. And so he calls me over and he says, uh, yeah, this isn't gonna work. The School of Life Sciences and the biology department don't want you to put emphasis on the biology. And these young faculty, had swayed the, the rest of the faculty to move in that direction, and they took it as a great victory. Well, a couple of them had gone out and purchased a couple hundred coffee mugs that said biological and agricultural engineering. And so here I'm in Ringel's office, knowing all this is taking place. They're actually working on new stationery and everything. And he says, this is gonna work, because it's just not gonna fly with the other biological components on campus. So I said, well, why don't we call it agricultural and biological engineering, put the emphasis on agriculture. He says, that'll work. I'll, don't say a word to anybody. I'll get it approved by the Board of Trustees, cast it in concrete, and that's the way it'll be. And it was a wonderful compromise. Ringel thought it was great. And inwardly, that was what I, I, I didn't like this biological stuff. And so I couldn't say a word. He said, don't say a word to anybody until the Board of Trustees approved it. So the, at the couple meetings later, the young faculty come in, passing out these cups that say biological and agricultural engineer. I couldn't say a word. And then it comes out on the, on the newspaper saying, Purdue has a new name for agricultural engineering. It's agricultural and biological engineer. Suddenly all these cups were, were worthless. But you know, it's a- They're collector's items. Yeah, I have a couple. But it's, it's, it just shows how the system works. You know, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes of, I'm sure. You, know, you, you can't see all of it. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm.
I want to ask you about that uh, Center for Assistive uh, Technology that you're on the Advisory Council out at Discovery Park. It's new. It's okay. we're still struggling with okay. what, what it's going to be and okay. where it's going to go. And the funding that helped start it is running out, and so you know I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. It's been an effort of uh, uh, Bob Hanneman, uh, who has a real passion for this. Um, my work with assistive technology for farmers, um, we've tried to write a couple of large proposals to fund it, and none of them have been successful. So right now, it's, we're in an awkward time because of budget issues, I don't see us starting. Uh, Where are the people that are on the council, what, what schools or departments are? Oh, they're Is from pretty well across campus, oh, industrial right. engineering, mechanical engineering, okay. electrical engineering, myself, um, people from speech and audiology, Special it's really education. interdisciplinary, right. so you're calling on that. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. The other was the USDA Agri Ability Program. Is right. that still going? Are yes, you involved it is. in that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we helped start that through um, uh, federal legislation in 1990, and we we managed it for 11 years. And then, with like many USDA projects or federal projects, they like to move these around a bit. So it went to Wisconsin for eight years, and then we just captured it back um, here a year ago, and so it'll be here for four years, hopefully for eight years, we don't know where it's going to go in this, these times of budget changes. But that project provides services to 22 other state projects across the country that have been set up to provide services for disabilities, uh, to, for farmers with disabilities. Um, when we started, uh, the funding originally had enough money to start a, a coordinating project and eight state projects. And during the first 11 years, we went from eight projects to 22 projects by increasing federal funding and other things that we worked on during that time. Mm -hmm. And that pro what we do is we manage an 800 toll-free line. Uh, we get calls from all over North America f for assistance. Uh, we host an annual training session for about 150 professionals that, that uh, work with farmers with disabilities, OTs, PTs, people like that. Uh, we provide much of the resources, the printed resources that are used, and we're currently trying to develop a new website uh, of, of resources and links that would be helpful. For you sort of like a referral, re, uh, <laughs> referral resource center. Well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, we have a faculty fellow? No. Oh, okay. What about family? Tell us a little about that. Well, I have five children, and I've been married twice. I have an older family and a younger family. Um, my oldest is uh, a lawyer in Indianapolis, and then my number two is in law school in Los Angeles, and number three is uh, works for the Boston Philharmonic in Boston. And Did they come to Purdue? Uh, no, none of them came to Purdue. They're, um, my oldest went to IU, my number two went to Cal Poly, number three went to Tufts, number four is an eighth grader here in town, and then I have a six-year-old. So for an old man, I, I, I'd have more if I could. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> oh, um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Comes to mind. A favorite Purdue tradition. Uh, I did have, but then they stopped it. That was the chili supper. <laughs> That's okay. A lot. Well, uh, some people like remember for homecoming years ago. We used to have the deco. They used to have the decorations at yeah, the residence halls, and yeah. but that that and that's a tradition that went for a long time. The courts right. is one that people still talk about. Right. And some, um, some alums say, I still have them. I may not be able to wear them, but I still have them. You know, I never thought about that. What okay. is it that I like about, as far as a tradition here at Purdue? I don't, nothing really... Okay, how about it. an outstanding event? Outstanding. I'm sure you, have, you can have more than one. Oh, yeah. I think the, the thing that happened at Williamsport was kind of, it was special because it was unexpected. It was not political. It was local people that demonstrated their appreciation for things that we were doing for them. Right. And I think that was special. Good. Uh, I think the elevator in our building, um, when we first wrote our, our first federal grant, we got, we, we received You're an ag administration? Ag, no, ag engineering. Oh, ag, okay. Uh, it's a th built in 1928, yeah. and there's an elevator shaft that was there, but no elevator. And so our we received word that 
one of our grants had been successful and conditioned upon the site visit. And we had two federal people come. One of them was in a wheelchair. He couldn't get to my office. We lost that grant. So I began a campaign that says, uh, we ought to have, you know, we ought to have an elevator. And, and we were told the building couldn't support it. It was engineering, it was out of, you know, the, here we had non-engineering people tell me that it wasn't feasible to do this. And I said, what you're really telling me is that you don't want to spend the money to do that. Why don't we just get it down to where we understand this? And, and so it created some interesting tension there. And then I finally took a group of them down to Indianapolis and showed them how a, a local hotel had put in an elevator rather efficiently and, and, and said, well, let's do it. You know, what's it going to take to do this? And I remember um, when we got that elevator put in, it was like, uh, I, I asked if I were to kick the bucket for any reason, we'd call it the Field Memorial Elevator. But it was, you know, it's hard to imagine the resistance yeah. that used to be on this campus yeah. to people with disabilities. I think special moments are, to me, uh, right now, as I, I, you know, I only have a few years left in, in a career here. As I have, you know, eight graduate students, and I think that that, that being able to leverage my interest and passion into those students is, a, is to me very special. You know, I see our, you know, like most recent uh, uh, PhD student is Sam Matthews, who could have taken and gotten seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year here. He chose to move to India, central part of India, and start a program for people with disabilities. And I know he's not being paid much at all, but he's doing what he wants to do. Right. Uh, one of my grad students moved to the Philippines and started a program, worked for 10 or 11 years, and ended up as the manager of Habitat for Humanities in the Philippines. And all I, you know, I hear back from faculty say, you know, if the people that you turn out screw up our average wage level. You know how departments like to say our <laughs> graduates make so much per year at an average? Well, mine all tend to do, do that, pull it down. It's okay. okay. It's okay. Right. I tell them literally. Any closing comments? Anything that I that you want to ask that you had um, to leave to you? I, I would say a couple of things. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I think one of the my unique opportunities has been to work with the Amish uh, over the last fifteen years. Uh, back in nineteen eighty six, about a third of all farm debts that year were Amish, and so we built a relationship with the Amish community. We held Oh, about 25 or 30 field days for the Amish. Uh, they've invited me in their homes to stay with them. And just to get to know that very special population that we don't serve very well you know, in the state. Because we don't really know them. We're not comfortable with them. And I found that to be quite good. No, 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 they're, uh, Elkhart, they're all over now. Oh. We got them in Brown County. We got oh, them okay. in Richmond, a large group there. We got them down in the Rockford area. We've been moving in. Because you know they pick land that's rather cheap, and sure. but they do things in as you know taking back agriculture fifty years, and so it exposes them to hazards that most farmers have gotten away from. And so I think that we've, we've had a real special impact on 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 that population by improving their safety and health by just keeping them alert to what you know what the problems are. So what they should be aware of. But, but otherwise, in, you know, in closing, I, I think the opportunity here has been fantastic. I mean, uh, the best job on this campus, and I was a department head for a while, and all they wanted me to do is eat. I think that's what a department head is really destined to do is eat. You're on call all the time to take people out to eat. And I gained weight, and I felt like I was always eating something. Whereas a faculty member, we, we can do whatever, especially when you get tenure, you can be very creative and you can do a lot of things, even that irritates people. Uh, but they might be stretching the boundary. And I, think, I can't imagine a better job than being a faculty member. And that's why I try to recruit students who want to be faculty members, who want to teach. Because I think you can really change a lot of people's lives. 
Very good. Thank okay. you very much. Sure. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. we're in good shape. You got a few minutes? I have one more form, but I, I, you're talking, I have to tell you this about Sagamore. I have a friend. Well, I'll tell you who it is. It's Jim Barron, industrial engineering. Okay. I'm not sure. Some of his former students. Jim had a major surgery some years ago. He had the triple A uh, down in the aneurysm that was pretty, but it was successful. And at that time, John Hottowald was head of IP, uh, Palco. Uh, another one of his former students was the lawyer for Citizens Gas, and then one was the president of Sony Dist down in Terre Haute. They went to Havana, and they said, we, we have this uh, former professor, and we'd like him to get a Sagamore. So we've got so Harry called me and he said, we've got this thing, but we'd like you and Jim to come to dinner at the athletic club in Indianapolis. And that's where we're going to do it. And I said, oh, Harry, I said, you better call Jim and, and you know, so invite us. So he did. So we were to be there. But anyway, I picked him up and we're driving down. And at that time, he was really watching us. Play. He was not a happy camper. He did not want to go down there for dinner. Mm -hmm. He said, I can't really have anything that's going to be, you know, chicken or something like that. I said, why don't they come up here for dinner? Why, why do we right. have to go down there? So we were to be there at 7.30, but we got there at 7. But if you remember the athletic club, there was the one oh, garage. Yeah. and mm -hmm. you could. So Jim says, I said, no, Jim, that's not the Jim. That's the garage. So we go in there. It was the wrong one. So we get in there. We park in the garage. We go to the each go to the separate restroom, and we ran into the wife of of Harry. So we all rode down in the elevator together. We walk into the main dining room and everybody was there. They had a harp. They had a harpist. And he was blown away. He was so surprised. It was wonderful. <laughs> and it's all framed. It was on the easel, well, so, you know, and they took it was so I know exactly. And we're sitting but there. Mine was in Arnie's and Williams. But, that, but that's okay. You know, I mean it's but but mm. he he's very they're very hard to surprise to surprise. Oh. In fact, one time for one of his birthdays I had some people over and I invited them and the truck was in the, the, the caterer's truck was in the driveway, right? So he knew right away that something was going on. Well, whatever. But he didn't know who was coming. Yeah. But it was, I mean, Arnie, Arnie's is great. I think that's mm -hmm. wonderful. You know, and well. it just, and he just had the most marvelous time and the pictures turned out well and it was it was spectacular. And it, it it's just hard to uh, to surprise people when they can do it. And I love to plan surprises anyway. You know? I don't like surprises. I like it. Sometimes, it's, sometimes you have to give it a little bit. You know, so it's all. So I turned, I turned uh, 60 this past year, and my secretary, Denise, messed up the year before and had this big party for me <laughs> when I was only 59. <laughs> and so I was showing up late because, you know, I, you know, I just... I, I knew what she wanted me up on the third floor. I go in there. 60, 60, 60. I said, I'm not 60, I'm 59. And then, there was, <laughs> so then they had to have another one this past year. <laughs> oh, I got one more to inform you. This is okay. for the, for the uh, that, but I really, that, you've been, it's been wonderful. And you really, you know, in fact, if, if you go out South River Road, the first farm on the left, has the board fencing. I'm sure you've oh, been yeah, to yeah, right? Yeah. That's Jim Barony's farm. And he recently bought some, so when you make the turn in the bend, he, uh, some property before he's picked it up, so he owns all of that all the way down to beyond okay. the farm. But, and he cash rents. He was in corn and soybeans, but now he's just in soybeans. But it's down near the river, so he can't really oh, see it. Yeah. I don't know where that is. He used to have, when his daughter was younger, he had horses out there right, and he had cattle. But yeah. he's, he did have cattle, but he's given up because it's too hard in the winter. And he has somebody who lives in the other house. 